Well, good morning, everybody. Good morning, everybody. Morning, United to City One. We should have some small rascals. Good to welcome you all this morning. Those of you online and those of you in here, very good to see you. Psalm 100 says, Make a joyful shout to the Lord, all you lands. Serve the Lord with gladness. Do you serve the Lord with gladness? Yes. yes. Good. Come before his presence with singing. Even if you've got a full voice, you can sing. <laughs> so make a joyful noise to the Lord. Know that the Lord, he is God. It is he who has made us, and not we ourselves. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. Is that a good thing to know, that we are his people? Yeah. <laughs> the Lord, creator of heaven and earth, creator of mankind, and we belong to him. Isn't that fantastic? Enter into his gates with thanksgiving. Are you thankful this morning? Yes. Are you thankful this morning? Yes. <laughs> Enter into his gates with thanksgiving and into his courts with and his truth endures to all generations. The truth is that God loves you this morning. You've never heard that, you've heard it now. The Lord loves you. And that's the truth. So we're going to hand over to Bronwyn. We're going to praise the Lord with all our hearts. Bronwyn and John, we're going to hand over to. <laughs> and Drew, we're going to hand over to. There's three of them. Let's just pray. Lord, we're so thankful to you this morning that you love us with an everlasting love. We thank you, Lord, that once we were in darkness, but now we're in your most marvelous light. The truth is, Lord, you've given us the gift of eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. And we're so grateful this morning in this world that has gone haywire. You are the rock of our lives. We we'll give you all the thanks and all the praise for our salvation. And everybody said, Amen. Amen. Amen.
just want to, I'm not the best readers in the world. But God laid it in my heart about a story that I just want to share with you this morning. So we're seeing this. And uh, I'm just taking it from there. Have you heard of a guy by the name of Derek Redmond? All right, he was an athlete. And um, I'm reading this book by him, which is named Mark Stilley. Restoring Fallen. And he really laid the story of my heart this morning. I'm going to try and read it to him. I'm not the best of readers, so forgive me. But we'll take it from there. Right. In 1992, Derek was running his final Olympic Games. And this was the last chance to fulfill a lifetime ambition to complete in the final of the world's greatest ever competition. Nearly at the starting blocks of the 400 meter semi finals, Derek read himself. The gun fired and he was off. Heading down the track and building up his speed. Derek only needed to finish in the first four to qualify for the final. To many watching, it was already a foregone conclusion. Except that on the final lap, something terrible happened. And Derek heard what he thought was the starter's gun going off, but it wasn't a pistol. It was his hand screen. It snapped, it, and he pulled up, and he fell. And the crowd uttered a collective gasp. Everyone behind Derek now passed him, running around two bends, then down the final straight towards the finish line. His dream was shattered. Derek got to his feet, and he started hobbling and then hopping. And as he approached the final bend, a short, stocky man in a white t-shirt and a Nike cap clambered over the low wall and went which divided the athletes from the competitors. And on his cap said, just do it. The older man jogged down the track, brushing away security, saying, I'm his father. Jim Redman, he shouted. The spectators at the stadium grew on their feet. Jim put in his arms, sorry, Jim put his arms around his son and began to walk him towards the finish line, supporting him all the way, taking the pressure off his son's disabled leg. And as they crossed the line, it was said that the ovation that was given the father and his crippled son was louder than any other winning event for that Olympics. And you know, folks, I just want to say this morning, there's some people that have started in this hall and you're running a race. And you're excited to start running that race. And you're excited to start running that race with the Father. And He's been training you. And something's happening. You feel like you've been crippled. You feel like your legs have been taken out under you. But the God wants to know that He's got you. He's got your arm around you. And as the world is watching you, as the world is watching you, as you feel the world is watching you, as you feel your friends and your families and your colleagues are watching you, what he's going to see is you're hobbling across that finishing line, victorious, and you're going to win people for the Lord in a situation rather than crippled by your injury. I just feel I want to share that with you this morning. But what you need to do is you just need to get up and you need to get going. You see, God says he will never leave us. He'll never forsake us. No matter what, He will never leave us. He will never forsake us. And we need to be careful that we don't look at the pain, that we don't concentrate on the injury, but we concentrate on the healer. We concentrate on the support that He's given us. And that's what I want to say. Thank you.
pray. Just receive thy faith. They anoint him for greater things. He's a great God. Greater things than these shall you do because I go to my Father, Jesus said. Just receive the anointing that's coming. The greater things. Unquenched Holy Spirit. I'm going to begin by reading a passage from the Apostle Paul uh, to the Thessalonian believers. There's one verse really that we're going to hone in on. Uh, I'm going to start a little bit before that and a little bit after that, just so we get some context. So if you're following in your Bibles, 1 Thessalonians 5, verses 16 to 22. 1 Thessalonians 5, verses 16 to to 22. Rejoice always, pray without ceasing, in everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. Do not quench the spirit, do not despise prophecies, test all things, hold fast what is good, abstain from every form of evil. So you probably worked out really which verse in particular from the title we're talking about today. But in that passage, the apostle tells us to do six things. To rejoice always, to pray without ceasing, to give thanks in all circumstances. Sometimes easier said than done, but that's the command. To test all things, to hold fast what is good, to abstain from every form of evil. And then he tells us two things that we are not to do. And they do link in quite closely together. We are not to quench the spirit and we are not to despise prophecies. Do not quench the spirit. So some translations say, do not extinguish the spirit. Do not stifle, do not restrain, do not subdue the spirit. The images of kind of putting out a fire, whether that be pouring water on it or suffocating it with a blanket. And of course, in the New Testament, fire is a symbol of the Holy Spirit. On the day of Pentecost, the Holy Spirit came as divided tongues of fire on the 120. And John the Baptist, speaking of Jesus, said, when he comes, he will baptise with the Holy Spirit and with fire. And it goes without saying, I'm going to say it anyway, that a victorious, effective, fruitful Christian life is one in which the Holy Spirit lives within the believer in an unquenched way. When we allow his fire in us to consume the whole sacrifice, not just a bit. 
the early Pentecostals, when they used to write letters to each other, they signed it off, K-O-F. Any guesses what that might stand for? The lock in the classroom now. I'll pick on you if you don't put your hand up. K-O-F. <laughs> what do you say, Uncle Les? Kids of faith. Kids of faith. <laughs> Nearly. I guess think back to what I just said. What the image we were talking about here. Nearly. I'm going to have to tell you in a minute. Keep on fire. Well done, Ed. And merit for you there. Well done. Keep on fire. Keep on fire. Keep on fire. In every letter that the early Pentecostals sent to each other. Not, of course, that we can lose the Holy Spirit. If we were to do that, then we'll cease to be Christians. We don't lose the Holy Spirit. We can lose the anointing sometimes. We can lose the fervour, the energy, the zeal, the, the belief sometimes. The Apostle Paul tells daily Christians to fan into flame the gift of God. Be being filled with the Holy Spirit. It's our responsibility. He told them to do something, didn't he? It's our responsibility to make sure that our spiritual temperature doesn't drop. And if we sense that it is, to do something about it. To stir ourselves up again in our most holy faith. And so in this message, I'm going to suggest six things that we can do to unquench the spirit in our lives. Some of the things we need to believe and some concern the way that we behave. So these are the six points, just to give you the heads up as we come through. Number one, we need to believe in who the spirit is. Number two, we need to believe in what the spirit does. Number three, we need to obey his inspired scripture. Number four, we need to obey his inspired promptings. Number five, we need to walk in holiness. And number six, we need to live in love. And if we do those things, I would suggest that we are allowing the spirit to move freely and powerfully in us as individuals and as a church as a whole. So let's jump in there. Number one, believe in who the Spirit is. And we live in times where I think doctrine has become a bit of a dirty word in the church, particularly churches like ours, I must say. People say, I'm not interested in doctrine, I just want Jesus. And I know what they mean by that, by the way. I know what they mean by that. But you try telling someone who Jesus is without doctrine. Jesus is the Son of God. Is the Alpha and the Omega. Is the, the Good Shepherd. You need doctrine. Not that it's all about doctrine, but we need to know who God is, don't we? We need to know who he is. And, and the Word tells us a lot about him. We need to acknowledge what the Bible says about the Holy Spirit. Who he is. So this is the basics, and I'm not trying to patronise anybody, but I think sometimes it's good to hear the basics. And of course, for some who might never have heard this before anyway. Fundamentally, the Holy Spirit is God. Amen. The third person yes. of the Trinity. Co-eternal, co-equal, consubstantial with the Father and the Holy Spirit. 1 John 5 verse 7. For there are three that bear witness in heaven. The Father, the Word, which is Jesus, and the Holy Spirit. And these three are one. Yeah. We see the Trinity, of course, at Jesus' baptism. Jesus in the Jordan, the Father speaking audibly, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. And the Holy Spirit descending as of a dove on him, anointing him for his public ministry. A common feature of the cults is to deny the divinity of the Holy Spirit. Did you know that? Jehovah's Witnesses, Mormons, Christian Scientists, Christadelphians, Unitarians, they would say that the Holy Spirit is God's active force, God's influence in the world. How disrespectful. How disrespectful to God. He is God. He's not a force. He is God. 
Of course, the Trinity is a mystery. Elisha teaches the Trinity to students, and sometimes they don't get it, but that's okay. We don't need to necessarily get it. Who wants a God that they can understand? Because they don't cease to be God, wouldn't they? You'll be God if you could figure him out completely. Some say the word Trinity is not in the Bible. Fair enough. The word revival is not in the Bible. But you can't read the Acts of the Apostles and say that revival is not a concept. The Trinity is a biblical concept. Most of us know this, I know, and could articulate simply <coughs> the doctrine of the Trinity. But do we always talk and behave as though the Holy Spirit is God? Friends, the Holy Spirit is not a plaything. It's not goosebumps. It's not a warm, gooey feeling. And I'm, I'm not saying, of course, that we can't experience the Holy Spirit. Because thank God we can. But he himself is not just a feeling or an emotion. He might manifest himself in that way. He also convicts of sin, righteousness and judgment, which could argue is much more important. We need to hold the Holy Spirit in his rightful place, which is showing the same reverence, love and holy fear as we do the Father and the Son. For anything other is to insult and to quench it. The Holy Spirit's a divine person. He's got a personality. The force hasn't got a personality, has it? The Bible says all these things of the Holy Spirit, that he speaks, he can be grieved, he teaches, he guides, he permits, he forbids. A force doesn't do those things, but a person, a divine person specifically, can. But to pray to the Holy Spirit and have a relationship with him, just as we do the Father and the Son. Mike Bickle says we walk in the Spirit to the extent that we talk to the Spirit. The Spirit within you. A Christian is a dwelling place for God. God lives in you. You are a temple. Not this building that we thank God for it. You are the temple of the living God. As our Scott once said, God is closer to us than our own skin. He couldn't get any closer. He's in you. So let's not neglect him. Let's value his presence. Let's call upon him in the day. Let's ask him questions. Let's talk to him. Because then we are going to walk in him as well. So that's number one. Is that okay? Number two. Let's believe in what the Spirit does. The Holy Spirit has various roles in Scripture. We see him brooding over the waters at creation. We see him anointing Bezalel to make the tabernacle, giving him the creativity and the intelligence. We see him clothing the judges to lead Israel before the kingdom was established. I want to focus, though, on two of the Spirit's key roles today. Number one is the author of the new birth. And number two is the worker of miracles. So author of new birth. John 3, verses 5 to 6, if you want to follow along. Jesus answered, Most assuredly I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. And in 1 Corinthians 12, verse 3, Therefore I make known to you that no one speaking by the Spirit of God calls Jesus accursed. And no one can say that Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. Friends, we can't come, become Christians without the Holy Spirit. We can't even believe without the Holy Spirit. It's got to move upon our hearts and reveal Jesus as both Lord and Christ. No one intellectually alone decides to become a Christian. It's a miracle wrought by the Spirit of God on people's hearts. Of course, we can't convert anybody. That's a consequence of what I'm saying. We can point the way in the way we live and what we say, but we trust him to do the saving work. Yeah. We can't do that. So if you feel that you have to do that, be released right now. You can't save anybody. No. <laughs> but just be salt, be light. That's, that's what we're called to be. <laughs> someone said an evangelist is someone 
who tells another beggar where to get bread. Yeah, a beggar telling another beggar where to get bread. That's all our responsibility is. We live in an age of self-help, don't we? I hate self-help. Self-help books, self-help podcasts, and I must say sometimes self-help can creep into the church as well. The church is not just here, friends, to tell you how to have healthy relationships, or how to manage your money, or how to do this and that. And again, they are good things. Hear me right. The Bible says we are dead in trespasses and sins. We don't need self-help, friends. Look where it got us. We need divine help. We need saving from someone outside of us. But God, rich in grace, stepped down outside of us in Christ and lifted us up. And we're seated with him in heavenly places. All three persons of the Trinity are involved in our salvation. The Father created the plan of redemption. Jesus implemented the plan in his death and resurrection. And the Spirit administers the plan to us who believe. They all work in perfect harmony to save us. It's beautiful. Praise the Father. Praise the Son. Praise the Spirit. Three in one. So that's the greatest miracle, conversion. Let's never forget that. Amen. Amen. So I'm becoming born again. Coming from darkness to light. Death to life. The power of Satan to the power of God. It's a greater miracle than creation. Because in creation, God makes us from matter that's compliant. But yet in conversion, he takes us with our God-hating hearts our rebellious nature and he transforms us from sinners into saints the people who hate God and our fists at God to people who love him and just want to read his word and be with his people and be his ambassador in this world but of course God the Holy Spirit does lesser miracles too and I'm not Hear what I'm saying when I'm saying lesser, lesser than salvation. Miracles in which the laws of nature are temporarily suspended. And the Bible's full of these. And I trust we have stories ourselves of these kinds of miracles. The early Pentecostal writer Harold Horton defined a miracle as this. A supernatural intervention in the ordinary course of nature. A temporary suspension of the accustomed order, an interruption, sorry, an interruption of the system of nature as we know it. <clears throat> I want to talk about two miracles today. And you will have heard me share this first story before, and I'm special you'll know the second story anyway. This very church, as many of us know, was established with a miracle of healing. So in 1926, Mr. and Mrs. Hawkins from North Wingfield Assembly of God were knocking on doors around Homewood. And they came to the Smith family. At that time, a non-Christian family. There was mum and dad, three children, aunties and uncles as well. And they came and told them about Jesus. And little Roy, two years old, had rickets, a deficiency disease. His legs were bowed. And Mr. and Mrs. Hawkins said, give us one of his vests. We'll take it. We'll pray over it. We'll bring it back to you, put it on him, and he'll be healed in Jesus' name. And so that's what they did. They took a vest, prayed for it, probably took it back to the church in North Wingfield. The saints prayed for it, took it back, put it on little Roy, and something happened, friends. I don't know all the details, because that's long before my time, and long before our time, too. But he was healed. Mum and dad converted. Auntie and uncle converted. The children converted. The family started going to North Wingfield Assembly of God. Some years later, George Smith, the dad, started meetings in a bedroom in Wannington Road, Homewood. 1949, they acquired this site on Tip Shelf Road. George Smith pastored the church from 1939 to 1965. Little Roy, who was healed, 
pastor of the church from 1965 to 1990, and some of you were converted under Roy's ministry and knew him personally. That's a true story, friends. A long time ago, relatively speaking, but a true story. One miracle, and this happened in a little village called Homewood. And the ministry is still going. Lives are still being touched by the grace of God. Amen. More recent miracle concerns our Mike at the back. And I said to him yesterday, do you want to come and share your story a little bit? And he wasn't sure how he felt. How do you feel, Mike? They don't not quite see it today. That's okay. I'll share it for you then. I wanted to give you the opportunity first. So in on the 8th of March 2012. I turned 18 four days before. A few of us went up to Bull to a Nathan Morris meeting in the City Hall. And Mike went, there were various people from the AOG and Clay Cross there as well. Of course, there was ministry, worship. <coughs> Nathan was, wanted to pray for the sick. And Mike at that time had had a stroke, which left him with paralysis. He was also deaf in one ear. He came in in a wheelchair. And he wanted to be prayed for by Nathan, the man of God. Nathan was occupied elsewhere, so he couldn't get to Mike. But some ordinary Christians, thank God for ordinary Christians, some ordinary Christians came over to Mike and laid hands on him. And I was there, not laying physically touching him, but I was there, arm out, praying for him as well. And friends, he got out the wheelchair. Yeah, he got out the wheelchair. I saw him. He could hear. He was restored physically. He pushed his wheelchair out of the city hall and the unsaved attendants were dumbfounded. He got home and he carried his wife over the threshold of the door, which he couldn't do when they married. How long before? A year before? Two years. A year before, yeah. Walked your children around Chesterfield the next day, is that correct? Yeah, this I think was on a Thursday, so I was at sixth form next day, you know, very intelligent people. But I was just telling them, I saw Jesus heal someone yesterday. And normally, I would have been a bit more reserved about saying that in that kind of academic environment. But I know what I saw, friends. I know what I saw. And he's still healed today. God does miracles. It says here, expect a miracle. And we need to. We've all had some disappointment in this area. And so I say that with sensitivity. But I'd rather believe than not believe. Wouldn't you? I'd rather believe than not believe. I want to be a believing believer. Not just a believer, but a believing believer. This is the biblical pattern. The signs and wonders to follow the preaching of the word. The Apostle Paul says this, For I will not dare to speak of any of those things which Christ has not accomplished through me, in word and deed, to make the Gentiles obedient, in mighty signs and wonders, by the power of the Spirit of God, so that from Jerusalem and round about till Il Iricum, I have fully preached the gospel of Christ. So that tells me that if we're not seeing signs and wonders following the preaching of the word, we're not fully preaching the gospel. That's what I take from it. We preach a full gospel, friends, don't we? A gospel for the spirit, the soul, and the body. Yeah. Some Christian friends of mine say that miracles like this and spiritual gifts ceased with the apostolic era. I don't see it from scripture, church history, or my own experience. If Jesus was no longer healed the sick today through the power of the spirit, can't be the same yesterday, today, and forever, can he? Which the Bible says he is. <clears throat> so let's actively expect God to work mighty miracles in our midst. Because if we're not expecting that, we're quenching the Spirit, aren't we? Number three, obey the Scripture. 2 Timothy 3, verse 16. All Scripture is given by inspiration of God. And it's profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man or woman of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. And also 2 Timothy 1, verses 20 to 21. 
no prophecy of scripture is of any private interpretation, for prophecy never came by the will of man. But holy men of God spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. Some Christians treat the word and the spirit like two opposing football teams. Yeah, people say, oh, I'm, I'm a man of the word. Or she's a woman of the spirit. Well, why can't we be both friends? Why can't we be both? You can't be a woman of the spirit and not love the Bible because that's the spirit's favorite book. He wrote it. Or specifically, men wrote it under the direct influence of the Holy Spirit. So the, the Bible's inerrant, which means without error, and it's infallible. It couldn't even contain any errors because it was written under the influence of the Spirit. All scripture is God-breathed, inspired by God. Friends, don't just passively wait for a word from God. Pick up your Bible. Pick up your Bible. That is the primary means by which God will speak to you. Occasionally, he will speak through a dream or a vision or a prophecy. We believe in those things and they have their place. But primarily, it's the Bible. And the Holy Spirit's within us to illuminate what we're reading. It's a rare privilege to have the author with you when you read the book. He'll tell you what it means. I'm not diminishing commentaries and Christian books. I, I love stuff like that. But my go-to first is, Holy Spirit, what does that mean? He wrote it. He knows. He knows. Don't just read the Bible. Ask the Spirit to read the Bible to you. Think on that. There are non-Christian men and women with PhDs in theology, and yet they know nothing worth knowing. I say that as someone who loves academia and literature, because the Bible is a spiritual book, and it can only be understood by the spiritually discerned, by those to whom the Spirit gives understanding. Which is why, why you cannot be a non-academic person and yet be the wisest person on the planet, because you understand God's book. Let's not grieve the Spirit by reading the Word on our own, trusting in our own intellect, or our own experience to understand it. Let's include the Holy Spirit in our Bible reading. I don't do it all the time, but I do try before I read. Say, Holy Spirit, will you give me revelation today? Would you show me something I've not seen before today? And I think the Holy Spirit loves that attitude because it shows humility. It shows that you don't think, well, I know it all, I've read that before. You, you come in willing to learn. And that's the kind of mentality that the Holy Spirit loves to bless. Are you still with me? Yeah. It's quite a long, it's nine pages this. So I'm, I'm trying to get through it, but I feel excited about this message. To tell you the truth, I feel the Holy Spirit's on it. <clears throat> Number four, obey his promptings. Now when they had gone through Phrygia, and the region of Galatia, they were forbidden by the Holy Spirit to preach the word in Asia. I love that verse. It doesn't say what forbid, forbidden by the Spirit looks like, but I would suggest it wasn't an angel or a dream or a vision because elsewhere in Acts it tells you if that happens. I would suggest that's that inward impression, that sense of a lack of peace about something. The prompting of the Spirit, the internal witness, whatever phrase you want to use. A sense of the Holy Spirit saying, go or no. And I remember a, a testimony my mum told me some years ago and it really excited me as an early Christian. She was doing the ironing and she heard a voice say, bring such and such. This was a lady in her home group at the time, which some of us do know. <clears throat> and then I dismissed it at first. She thought, just myself, you know, my own thoughts, because it's an internal voice. She carried on ironing. She heard it again, ring so and so. And she said, All right, well, I'm just going to finish this shirt and, and then I'll ring them. And then again, ring them now. It was insistent. And she obeyed. And she rang this lady. 
And this lady was just about to kill herself. She was in a really difficult time. And then our counselled her from the scriptures over the telephone, and she didn't kill herself, thank God. And she's still with us, loving the Lord today, maybe watching online, perhaps. The promptings of the Spirit, friends. It could be a matter of life or death. God wants to speak to us in mundane times. Don't relegate when he can speak to you to a Sunday morning or within these walls. He wants to speak to you when you're washing the pots, when you're driving the car, when you're doing the ironing. He wants to be in the mundane with you. There is nothing secular in a Christian's life. It's all spiritual because you are the temple of God. Of course, sometimes we miss it. We're fallible, aren't we? A few of us went to a meeting in Shiba last month, Andrew Shearman, and he told a story of during a meeting, he had a prompt of the Spirit, and he ignored it, and he regretted it ever since. And he said to the Lord, I, I want never to do that again. I'm going to go with whatever it is I feel that I'm to do, no matter what. And he sought to live by that all these years. And even later in this message, I want to create a time for the Spirit to move. And that's outside my comfort zone a bit because I'm a teacher and I like to micromanage and plan. But I know that God's bigger than that. And I believe in, in the liberty of the Spirit. So let's trust that we all hear Him because we do. Can I just set some of you free? You hear God. You hear God, all of you. The first verse I ever preached from, from this pulpit, age 15, Romans 8, verse 14. For as many who are led by the Spirit of God, these are the sons of God. To be a child of God is someone who's led by the Spirit. It's part of your identity. Expect his leadings and be quick to follow. And if you miss it, say sorry and move forward in his grace. Number five, walk in holiness. He is the Holy Spirit. Wherever you go, whatever you do, you're involving the Holy Spirit in that activity. That's the argument the Apostle uses against sexual immorality, because you're involving the Lord in that action, because it's inside you. The prophet Amos says, can two walk together unless they are agreed? The answer is no. And that goes for earthly marriage as well as our covenant with the Lord. We're called to live holy lives, aren't we? Not to be saved, but because we are saved. Not to please God save me, but thank you God you saved me. I get to be like you. I get to be like God. It's more than just our behaviours. And to do what the Lord said, trying to do once. The heart of the matter is the matter of the heart. The law says, don't murder. Jesus says, don't hate. The law says, don't commit adultery. Jesus said, don't lust. It's not about what other people see. It's not about the acts. It's about the heart. So you could be a very religious person with it all together, but your heart could be foul. And no one might even know what God sees. And that's the point. I've got no interest, friends, in appearing like someone's got it all together. I really haven't. It's what he sees, what he knows, what goes on where people can't see. I care more about that than what other people think about me. To continue in a habitual sin after becoming a Christian is to insult the spirit of grace. It's a grave sin. But thank God that Jesus not only saves us from the penalty of sin, justification, he saves us from the power of sin, sanctification. The Holy Spirit's in you, that you can be holy. You've not got to do it yourself and just make it happen. It's meant to flow naturally from the inside out. Let's make the Holy Spirit at home in us. We've already seen that the Holy Spirit is compared to a dove. Did you know that a dove is a very shy, easily startled bird? 
You can't tame a dove either. It's wild, undomesticated. The ancient Celts, the earliest converts to Christianity on these islands, they called the Holy Spirit the wild goose. Have you heard that before? The wild goose? In other words, the Holy Spirit won't adjust to you. You need to adjust to the Holy Spirit. Why should he have to adjust anyway? He's God and we're not. We adjust to him. Let's not give the dove cause to take off. And again, I'm not saying we can lose the spirit. We can lose a sense of his conscious presence, a sense of the anointing, if we continue in habitual sin and grieving. And again, we all fall short. See, it's grace and truth, isn't it? I'm bringing some truth, but here's the grace part, because we all fall short. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sin and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Friends, if you blow it, don't hide from God. Go straight to him, confess it, press the lead and move on in the grace of God. For there's work to do. It's a life to live. Don't wallow for a week or two. Don't stop coming to church until you suddenly feel, I'm okay now. No, press the lead, move on, get back into it. Because that is what grace does. That's what the blood of Jesus does. Come into agreement with God. Call it out for the foul sin that it is. And move forward. Last one. Live in love. This is Jesus in John 17. I do not pray for these alone, these 12. But also for those who will believe in me through their word. This is us. Jesus praying for us. That they all may be one. As you, Father, are in me and I in you. That they also may be one in us. That the world may believe that you sent me. And another scripture. This one is 1 John 4, 7 to 12. Beloved, let us love one another. For love is of God. And everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. He who does not love does not know God, for God is love. In this the love of God was manifested toward us, that God has sent his only begotten Son into the world, that we might live through him. In this is love, not that we've loved God, but that he loved us, and he sent his Son to be a propitiation for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. No one has seen God at any time. If we love one another, God abides in us, and his love has been perfected in us. He can't be the word, can he? I could almost leave it there. The word is clear and direct. We are to love everybody. Everybody. Whatever creed, colour, however objectionable, their beliefs or their behaviour might be, we are to love them with all of our hearts. And there should be an extra measure of love to your fellow Christian. The Apostle Paul said this, therefore, as we have opportunity, let us do good to all, especially to those who are of the household of faith. It's only natural with family, aren't we? We've been made one through the blood of Jesus, the one blood. That's what family means. And it's a miracle how the Lord unites people from all different cultures and backgrounds and makes them one in Him. And you could go virtually anywhere on this planet and there'll be a, a body of believers somewhere this morning meeting. It's glorious. Unfortunately, this doesn't always happen, does it? We're, about, we're on the way of salvation, but we're not fully saved yet. I know as, as I say that, some of you will be like, huh. let me tell you what I mean by that. We've been justified. That is a done deal. Our spirits are perfect, been made alive. We're being sanctified. We're becoming more holy. And one day, friends, when we see Jesus and receive our glorified bodies, we are going to be glorified, fully saved from the presence of sin. Not just its penalty or its power. 
So to be fair, I avoid saying these days, I'm saved. I know, I know we say that quite commonly, but my conviction at the moment is I'm not going to say that because I'm not fully saved yet. I'm not fully saved yet from the presence of sin. I'm still vulnerable to various temptations. I can be angry, I can be jealous, I can be proud, I can be lustful. I'm not fully saved yet. But in my future glorified body, I look forward to seeing Jesus and saying, I am saved fully. Saved to sin no more. So because we're not yet fully saved, our behaviour towards each other can fall short. We've all injured a brother or sister. And been injured by one as well. I can see some nodding heads in the room. We've all been there. It grieves the spirit profoundly when Christians gossip about each other. And slander each other's churches and set up rival factions. It's grossly offensive to God. And we behave like this, we hinder the answer to Jesus' prayer in John 17 that we might all be one as he is one with the Father. Jesus said elsewhere, By this all men will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. The world's watching, friends. The world's watching the Christians. Are we showing this agape love that we talk about? Are we laying down our lives for our sister and our brother, as the John Pickering song goes? The Apostle John's brutal. If we can't love our brother, who we can see, we can't love God who we can't see. It's a delusion. The 4th century theologian Jerome told this story, and I've shared this many years ago here as well, that at the end of the Apostle John's life, because he was the last Apostle living, he was the only one not to be martyred, he was really physically infirm on the Lord's day. The saints would carry him in on a couch into the assembly, and he just had one word for them, one sermon, one sentence even really, and it was this. Little children love one another. Week after week, week after week, little children love one another. Little children love one another. And Satan said to him, Master, why do you always say this? Can't we have something new? Because we've all thought like that, haven't we, sometimes? I've heard that before. And John, this is what church history says, not scripture, but John said, because it's the Lord command, Lord's commandment. And if this only is done, it's enough. I'll say that again. Because it's the Lord's command. And if this only is done, it's enough. Let's love each other, friends. Truly, as sisters and brothers, we've all got foibles, eccentricities. We're all a bit weird different ways, <laughs> some more than others. <laughs> but there are no ifs or buts here. You don't say, oh, you can love them, but no, nah, not them. Love unequivocally. Love boldly. Love with all your heart. Love even if you've been hurt. And if you've been hurt, seek God to pour in the oil and the wine, the kind that restoreth the soul. We've covered a lot this morning. Thank you for being really attentive to God's word. I think the Holy Spirit loves that. Can Roman and the worship team join on the platform? So I feel a real need this morning to, to open up an opportunity for response, not in terms of me laying hands on people, but I think we need to create an opportunity for us individually to call out to God in public about an area that we feel that the quenching the spirit in. And as I say, this is me trying to step out and wait a bit here. Because I like a nice tidy sermon. I could have wrapped this up and we could have gone home. But I feel pressed by the spirit to do this. So let's just see what happens. <clears throat> I'd like us to agree together concerning our individual blockages where we've stifled the spirit. 
want to give us opportunity to, to call out to God. Be raw, not about tiny prayers, friends. Be raw about one of these six that you feel is holding you back. You've not got to go into details or share inappropriate things because God knows your heart. But it's good to say amen. Amen, amen to each other's prayers. So be it, so be it for you. So be it for you. So be it for you. Prayer of agreement. Can we all stand up? To remind us all of these six blockages. And even as I'm saying them, I'll say them slowly. Ask the Spirit which one is burdened to you at this time. Which one is holding you back? Is it wrong beliefs about who the Spirit is? Is it wrong beliefs about what the Spirit does? Is it a matter of disobeying the Spirit's Scripture? Is it a matter of disobeying the Spirit's promptings? Is it not walking in holiness? Is it not living in love? So I'm just going to pray for what I think is my issue. And then I would encourage you, friends, not to miss this moment. Because it's so easy to step out of the boat. Be willing to get uncomfortable. Pray and give a short prayer. Get involved because this will be a really powerful moment in our lives. So, Lord, I come to you in front of my brothers and sisters this morning and I say, Lord, I want to walk in holiness. Amen. Not just when people are watching, but Lord, I want my thoughts to be holy. I want my attitudes to be holy. I want my heart to be holy. Not because I'm trying to earn anything. Because I'm grateful that you saved me and set my feet high upon a rock. I can't do it, Lord, without you, but you are the Holy Spirit in me, and you will make it possible. And I thank you for it in the name of Jesus. Friends, I just encourage you, one by one, to call out to God. Do business with God this morning, and we'll stand with you and agree with you. Come Holy Spirit. Come Holy Spirit. Come Holy Spirit. Keep going, guys.
ongoing, guys. A bit longer, don't miss your opportunity. If you know you need to do business with God today, call out to Him. We all do, to be honest. Father, I don't want to miss opportunities. The 
Because, Father, when we move by the Spirit and we walk in the Spirit and we pray through the Spirit, that's when we're going to see miracles. That's when we're going to see people saved, healed and delivered. So this morning, Father, I just yield to you afresh this morning, the Holy Spirit within me. And I want to give him all the praise and all the glory in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Stand with you, Jenny. Brilliant. We'll go for a couple more minutes, guys. If you know you need to speak out, do it. Otherwise, you'll regret it this afternoon. Obey his promptings. fresh today with your wisdom with your knowledge with your understanding on how to deal with life and this world so that the world can see Jesus in us and through us by how we talk how we walk and how we live Father we thank you for the Holy Spirit Holy Spirit we thank you that you're with us you're with us you're with us 
give us more of you and draw us deeper, deeper into you as we want to know you, as we long to know you, as we build to love you, as we learn to trust you, as we learn to walk with you. Come and just give us more of you and Father of your glory. Just let it shine through us. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name.